And that, that's to say even more clearly that your brain just isn't in your head. It's like, it's all the way up. It's all the way from, and this is a nice Piagetian viewpoint because, you know, in some sense what Piaget says about children is they sort of organize themselves from the spinal level upwards. You know, they learn these little subroutines. First of all, they have a few subroutines. Those are like built right into the spine. And then they start playing with those and chaining them together in flexible ways and they keep doing that you know, in more and more complex ways until they're capable of the abstract representation of thought. And you can see how this will work as we go through the, the nervous system. So, your brain's in your body. In fact, there's some evidence, and there, there's more than one kind of nervous system too, right? There's the central nervous system that allows you to move voluntarily and that, you know, provides you with sensory feedback, some of which you're conscious of. There's also the autonomic nervous system that runs your all the complex machinery that you're too stupid to attend to you know, because your consciousness gets little jobs it doesn't get to run your liver, for example you imagine what your life would be like if you were in charge of your liver it's like, you'd have been dead years ago, because what do you know about livers? so you have a whole system, like the autonomic nervous system which has more neurons than the central nervous system that just runs all that stuff for you which is, you know, a good thing, you know, and then you don't have to pay attention to it so so anyways, there's a lot of distribution of neural tissue throughout your body and th there's even some evidence that you have a like a second brain of sorts in your solar plexus where, you know, that's perhaps part of the reason why you really don't like to get hit there but there's a tremendous number of serotonergic neurons, for example, in your, in your midsection and there's increasing evidence that those are associated with things like emotion and mood and so the idea that the brain is here, it's like, mm, no, not, not really. It's, it's a continuum. You know, your body is a psychophysiological entity. And to separate it into body and mind is like, it's not right. The other thing that seems to be increasingly clear among, say, the robotics guys is you can't even be smart unless you have a body. And so that's why the advanced, advanced intelligence guys are building robots from the bottom up. They're doing it just like Piaget would have suggested. It's like, well, build some things that can move and then chain those things that can move together so that they can move in more complex ways and then chain them together so they can work in more complex ways and once you've got this thing that can do things, then stick a brain on it and that'll, then it'll have things it can do with its brain and if you don't do it that way, you get something that can't function intelligently. It's close to that. So, so there is the brain and the major, one way of dividing it into its major subcomponents is represented. There's a variety of ways you can do this. You can divide it into hemispheres because it's sort of split down the middle. The right hemisphere seems to be kind of specialized for the processing of unknown information. And the left seems to be more comfortable working where you know what's going to happen. And that the left is most generally the linguistic part of the brain, although not always. It's, it's a rough, you know, what would you call it? It's a rough truth. There's lots of exceptions. The, the linguistic system tends to specialize in the left. And the left sort of insists that it knows what's going on. And the right is always looking out for things that don't fit and sort of convincing the left slowly and sort of under the table to change its viewpoints. And that seem, a lot of that seems to happen when you're asleep and you're dreaming. So the right, maybe what's happening when you're dreaming is that during the day your cognitive processes are pretty tight and defined and they better be right? because you don't want to be dreaming your schizophrenic dreams in the daytime, that's a bad idea so you've got to stay kind of focused and, and narrow in a way during the day but the problem with that narrowed, narrow focus is that you're not paying attention to a lot of things and so it kind of looks like your right hemisphere keeps track of the potentially important things that you're not keeping track of and sort of and then at night your, your category system sort of broadens and loosens you can tell that in dreams because they're so weird and that's maybe when the right hemisphere is sort of tapping some new information into the left and playing with how it might be recategorized without completely overwhelming the left because you don't want to, just because you learn something new doesn't mean you want to upset yourself totally, right? so it's a, real, it's a real complex dynamic between stability and learning and it's conceivable that's why you have two hemispheres so, who knows it's good theory though, and, and the guy who came up with it fundamentally, his name is Goldberg um, Alcon and Goldberg, he was a student of Alexander Luria's, who was a great neuropsychologist 
So, you know, it's a credible, it's a credible idea. So, here's some rough divisions. You've got your cerebellum. That cerebellum, we don't know what the hell that thing does. If you don't have one, you get all wobbly. But there's more neurons in the cerebellum than there are in the rest of the brain. So, like, is it just making you not wobbly? It seems like a tremendous devotion of resources to something that's relatively simple. So, uh, alcohol, when you're a new drinker, alcohol is really hard on the cerebellum, which is why you're, you know, totally useless in a motor way and you fall down and all those things happen. But, so that's the cerebellum, and we don't know what it does, even though it's very complexly branched, it kind of looks like a cauliflower, and it's just packed full of neurons. And then there's the occipital lobe, and that you kind of use that to see with, more or less. And then the parietal lobe kind of keeps, helps you keep track of who, who you are from a bodily perspective, and sort of where your body's located in space, and sort of who you are as an embodied person. So, for example, if you lose the right parietal lobe because you have a stroke, then you lose the left side of your body, and even more weirdly, you lose the left side of everything. So all of a sudden you can't see the left side of anything. And no one can figure out what that's like, because say I'm looking at this room, and I have this parietal damage, if I'm looking at the room, do I not see the left side of the room? And then if I look at you, all of a sudden I don't see your left side. Like, we can't figure that out. It, like, the left is gone, but then the left is relative to where you happen to be looking. Now, I think one of the ways of understanding it is sort of like, you know how you clearly can't see anything behind your head? And it's not black where you can't see, right? It's black if you close your eyes. But there's a difference between what you can't see behind your head and the black you see when you close your eyes, because the black sort of seems like nothing. But compared to what's behind your head, it's, it's not nothing at all. So I think what happens with people who have neglect, parietal damage, is that that like, back part just goes like this. And so instead of you, know, you seeing this much of the world, and this being just not there at all as far as vision is concerned, it goes like this. And so then you've only got like a quarter of the world that you're... And so people like that, sometimes they'll throw their own legs out of bed. So they wake up and they think, oh my god, because they can kind of detect the left, but not very well. And they're quite freaked out because, you know, like, do you really want to wake up with a leg in bed with you? No. So they grab it and throw it out, and that's not so good because they're attached to it. Or so <laughs> they'll eat, they'll eat, and they only eat half the food on their plate. But if you turn the plate, then they'll eat half of the half that's left. So anyways, that's the parietal lobe. Temporal lobe. That enables you to hear, roughly speaking. There's a lot of um, memory there, too. And the frontal lobe, well, first of all, the frontal lobe seems to allow you to make voluntary movements, sort of at the, at the highest level of abstraction. And then the prefrontal cortex, which would be right at the front of the yellow there, it's sort of like the back part of the, of the frontal lobe enables you to make voluntary movements. But the prefrontal cortex enables you to represent the potential motor movements that you might make before you implement them. And so it evolved out of the motor strip during the course of evolution. It's sort of like, well, first you learned how to act voluntarily, and then as that grew, and it's particularly big in human beings, that part was able to divorce actions from your body, represent them in an abstract space, run them as simulations, calculate the outcome, and then implement them or not. And, you know, it's a... It's a it's a hit and miss business because lots of you people undoubtedly simulate catastrophic outcomes and then go do whatever it is you were going to do anyways. Like, you know, that happens to people all the time, say, when they're trying to stop drinking or to stop using cocaine or not to binge eat. Or, so, you know, your prefrontal cortex can whip up these simulations, but other parts of your body can override them quite, quite badly. So that's sort of roughly the brain.